If you have a Bible, Philippians 1, and as you turn there, just want to uh, also say it feels like we are home. I mean, we're, we're, we're 30 minutes away, but a lot of the announcements and things talked about, it's like, whoa, are we just in a, a you know, same campus in a different building? Because uh, we're taking a team to Ecuador as well. And so we're, we're going to miss you all by one week, um, but it's just amazing. And then um, the lady who opened the, the service talking about joy, that's what I want to talk about. So the Holy Spirit is at work in bringing unity even in different congregations. And uh, it's just amazing to see how God works. So thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. I, I just love being in our, our, our pastors. We're real excited to hear about Dan filling in the shoes of um, being pastor. And uh, we, we, just, uh, so we love Dan, we love Dustin, and we just love... To, to partner together. We're on the same team, just different locations. So that's a, a wonderful thing. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to or, or seen a TED Talk or a motivational seminar. You, you see these motivational speakers and, and they, they show up and, uh, you know, they're great. They're, they're trying to tell you how to have great success, right? Great confidence and sometimes great joy. Um, and, and you kind of look at the backlog and how they get there and who they are and they fly in on their leisure jet and they take a limo from the, the airport into wherever they're speaking. And it's, I'm thinking, if I had a Learjet, yeah, I'd maybe have a little bit more joy as well. <laughs> and not that it's going to make me even more happy, but it might help, right? I mean, like, this sounds just, gosh, must be nice, right? must be easy for you to talk about confidence and success because look at your life. But then you're thinking, or, or I, I think, I, I, I don't want to learn about success or even joy from someone like that. I mean, it, it might be nice, good information, but it would be great to learn about confidence and joy from someone who's going through the trenches. Someone who's not had a really easy life and going through some of the things that I feel like I'm going through, and that's the Apostle Paul. And he writes this unbelievable letter or book about joy. The last several years before writing this, he's spent two years in a prison in Caesarea. He's been put on a ship in chains on the way to Rome to go in front of Nero, who wasn't a real nice guy. He's been shipwrecked. He's been stranded on an island. He's been bitten by a snake. He's spent two more years in a Ro Roman prison awaiting execution. Been chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day, no privacy, constant illness, and yet this man, Paul, writes this book about Joy. And in, in chapter one of Philippians, I want to begin reading with the, you know, the tail end of verse 18. Because he says, in, in, in what he's dealing with, but yet he says, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus... Christ, it, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance, and I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will be, will no way be ashamed, but will have suf sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm going on living in the body, this would mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what should I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to be de depart and be with Christ, which would be far better, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And I'll stop reading there, but I want to look at some things because he points out some things. Where does Paul 
get his courage? What's the source of Paul's strength that we can learn from him? As believers of Christ, we want to be strong in the faith. We know that joy comes from the Lord, not circumstances. But how does Paul, in, just in this little passage, talk about where his strength actually comes from? In verse 19, he says, my faith is in the Lord. How do I have strength in order to continue on? My faith is in the Lord. For I know what happens to me will turn out for my deliverance. I know. That word know is something he knows for certain. It's not just wishful thinking for Paul. No, he knows. I want to look at several other just little verses because Paul repeats himself a lot with some of these things. Earlier, Paul had written in Romans 8, a lot of us are familiar with this verse, God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, Paul didn't just write that so we can put a magnet on our refrigerators. No, Paul wrote that because he believed it, and now he is actually living out this reality. He's living this truth in his own life. Notice it says, for I know I have faith, and I know through your prayers, the prayers of the people. Paul really appreciated the prayers of the people of Philippi. Not just Philippi, but other places. Let's look at um, what he wrote to the Corinthians. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. On him we have set our hope that, we, that he will continue to deliver us. How? As you help us by your prayers. Look what he says in Romans. He wrote to Romans, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. He wrote to the Ephesians and pray in the Spirit on all occasions in all kinds of prayers and requests with this, there we go, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of God's people. Would you pray also for me? That whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Look what he wrote to the, the people in Thessalonica. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. And a little bit later, as for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that our message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. There is nothing more encouraging for those who are in ministry knowing that people are praying for you and praying for them. Do you let people know that? Do you tell Pastor Dan, Pastor Dustin, your small group leader, Awana leaders, if you have Awana, I don't know if you have Awana, do you, do you tell people in the church that I am praying for you? And the gift that that is to them. We need to be praying for one another. He says, I have faith and I have prayers of the people. That's what keeps me going. That's what gives me joy. That's what gives me certainty. It's the prayers of the people. He doesn't stop there. He also says, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit... Of Christ, It's the power of the Holy Spirit that is keeping him afloat, that is giving him strength, that is giving him joy, that is helping him continue on. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. We all remember Acts 1 verse 8. You will receive 
power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It says in Ephesians 3, verse 20, the Lord is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think or imagine. How? According to the power that works within us. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that's given him strength and confidence and joy. He also has hope. His faith and he has, he has hope. I eagerly expect and hope. You can't live without hope. There was a study done by uh, Cornell University. They did a study of, of POWs from World War II. Here's what they said. They said, man can handle tremendous stress and pressure as long as they have one thing, hope. But once hope is gone, it's over. Where do you put your hope? And wherever you put your hope, is that source reliable? Many people, I don't know if they would say it out loud, but they hope in themselves. I'll just get this done. Yeah, I'll take care of that. And that's a pretty big burden. No wonder some people are so stressed and anxious and burned out. Because we hope in ourselves that we will work our way out of something Sometimes we put our hope in our spouse. That's not fair. Think of the burden that you're putting on another person and they will let you down. Anything created or anyone created will let you down if we put our ultimate hope in them. Sometimes we put our hope in, in circumstances. Oh, they're just going to change as soon as I get through the end of this month and I'm going to... Or elections. If this just goes our way, oh, it's going to be incredible. I, 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 hate to, I hate to let you down. If it does go your way, you will be disappointed. <laughs> Somewhere, somehow, it's not going to be perfect for you. Maybe better in your mind or whatever. And we know that the ultimate hope that will never let us down is the hope of God, our Father, who promises great gifts, and he is good for all of his promises. We put our hope in him. Then we see Paul has a purpose beyond himself. He's got a purpose for living. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He's had everything taken away from him. His friends, his ministry, his freedom, his privacy in a lot of ways. How does he keep going on and talking about rejoicing? Well, he has a purpose far beyond just his life. He's got a purpose. And, and, and we, we see this in other places of Paul in Acts. There we go. However, I consider myself worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race, complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying of the good news of God's grace. He also says in chapter 21, then Paul answered, I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Think of the, here, listen to the purpose that Paul has. And once again, he's not just writing about it. No, he is living this out. He truly believes that he has a purpose on this earth to tell others about Jesus. Romans 14. For none of us live for ourselves alone. None of us die for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or we die, we belong to the Lord. 
He's saying the same thing, just in different letters and in different words. He has a purpose for living. That's why he says, for me to to live is Christ and to die is gain. I am here for a reason. What's your purpose? Besides your job, which is probably pretty neat. Way to go on that, and that's neat. I think you have a, a, a bigger purpose of why you're here. You know, I heard a, a story of about a, a, a Christian camp, and, uh, and this was several years ago, but this Christian camp, you know, during the summer a lot of students would come, and they did men's retreats and women's retreats, and the, the chef was a, a lady, and she just loved to cook, and everyone loved her cooking. You would go to camp, and you knew you would eat well. And so, you, typical camp fashion, after everyone eats their meals and they're scraping the, the plates and they're stacking the plates and cups and things, and they would put, pass around a, a coffee, uh, old coffee jar, and you would put the silverware in the coffee jar. And the, the chef would come on to the microphone and say, hey, everybody, put all your silverware in the coffee pot or can." But hold on to your forks, because the best is yet to come. <laughs> and you can imagine, you know, high school, middle schoolers, and they every 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 lunch and dinner, the best, and they just the best is yet to come, the best is yet to come, and they're just pounding and pounding, and and that's what she was known for. She had great cooking, but she was known because she made incredible desserts. She passed away. She had a disease, so she was able to plan and, and, and talk about you know, her funeral service. And she says, at my funeral service, I want an open casket, and I want you to put a fork in my, my hand. <laughs> so the pastor said it was amazing. You know, great service, and at the end of the service, casket is up front, and as everyone is filing to the front, you know, it's... You know, kind of sober-minded, and they're coming to the front to pay their respects and say their last goodbyes. And then they see the fork, and they would smile. Some would chuckle because they knew the point that she was trying to communicate. The best is yet to come. And Paul knew this. Paul's living with this tension, knowing that he would rather be in the presence of Jesus, but also knowing that Jesus has a role and a purpose for him here. I would rather be here, but if I'm here, I am all here, and I will rejoice because I have purpose for you leaving me here. It's an amazing thing. If you were to finish this phrase, how would you fill this in? For me to live is what? What would you say your purpose is? And not just a church Sunday school answer. Oh, I know the right answer. Of course it's Jesus. That's nice. Let's look at your time. Let's look at your checkbook, right? And that's what pastors always say. Let's look at your passions, what you spend most time reading or paying attention to because many would say you know they would fill that in and they would say possessions for me to live is to gain a bunch of great things that I can enjoy and have possessions there's a, a cliche that says you know we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like <laughs> right I like this one even better. We try so hard to keep up with the Joneses, and the minute we catch up, we find out they refinanced. <laughs> Love that. But don't we do that? I mean, when we're little kids, it's like, you know, little, little kids, and they're trying to get the attention of mom and dad. Watch me, watch me, watch me. They just want the attention. They want to be loved. They want to be seen for what they're doing. And we grow up and we do the same thing. It just looks a little different. Look at the car I'm driving. 
Look at how many sales I got. Watch me. Nothing wrong with that, but is that your ultimate purpose of why you're still here on earth? Some would, would say pleasure or retirement. I don't know if we'd say it out loud once again, but I am amazed that many of my Christian friends who talk about retirement more than they do heaven. Planning for retirement. What's your goals this year? Planning for retirement. I want to plan for heaven. I want more people to be with us in heaven. That's our purpose. Not retirement. I, I, I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's great. But never stop working for the Lord. Never let that be your replacement for your eyes on heaven to be in the presence of Christ. That's what he wants for us. So we've seen a lot of things. We, he, he continues to have this strength because he has faith. He has prayers of the people. He has the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. He has this hope that he is continuing to hold on to. He has a purpose that is greater than himself. And a lot of times how Paul writes his letters, a lot of times he'll say a lot of theology, and then here's how you live this out. The, the similar is, is, is true here. It's not necessarily theology, but here's how I have my strength. Okay, now here's how you live that out. So just briefly, I want to look at that next portion of, of Philippians because I think it's important because Paul as he's writing to the, the, the church in Philippi he's saying you know what you want to have confidence you want to have joy this is the strength of my joy but he's starting to see as and it's a great church for the most part but he's starting to see once we step into living for Christ the enemy wants to tear you down So here's the strength, or here's, the, here's how I get my strength. And here's, I'm starting, to see, I, I'm starting to see in the church some disunity. I'm starting to feel, see, sense some people feeling like they, the, the feeling of self-doubt or inadequacy. I can't do it anymore. I can't lead this group. I, 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 I'm, I'm, who am I? Persecution and, and tension. And, and so I just want to look at verses 27 through 30 quickly. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles. Oh, I'm in the wrong book. I'm sorry about that. So I'm thinking that didn't make sense. Here we go. Whatever happens, so here's my, the source of my strength. Now, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a ma wor manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you will stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, because this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed and that you will be saved in that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle that you see I had, and now hear that I still have. He, he points out a couple different things. How do you lift this out? Well, the first thing he says is, you want to stand firm. Stand firm on the gospel, on the truth of who God is. He says this in other places. He says, be on your guard in 1 Corinthians 16. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong. 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, he talks about for now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. And of course, Ephesians 6 with the armor of God. He lists the armor saying so that you can stand firm. 
He says, don't give up. Don't give up. You may feel like giving up, but I want you to stand firm. And then he goes further than that. I want you to stand firm with one spirit. I want you to be unified. You have a a body of believers that is praying for me. They're hopefully praying for each other. But as you stand firm together with the community and how important it is. And we're reminded of this in Hebrews 10. Do not give up meeting together. We need each other. Some of my buddies are like, yeah, I don't really go to church anymore, but I listen to this podcast and this, and they're all great preachers. And I just flat out, you're not going to church. That, that's not church. A church is a place you can come and you gather and use your spiritual gifts to be a blessing to other, each other, and you can be blessed by their spiritual gift. It's important that we gather together. In one spirit, right? I don't know if this is a norm for you, so it, play along if you don't mind. I'm going to count to three. So I'm going to say one, two, three. And then I want you to say out loud your favorite sports team. <laughs> it, could be, it could be professional, hockey, tennis. Well, tennis isn't really a team. Um, hockey, football, whatever. It could be your favorite college team, the Mustangs, or whatever. Um, but let's just try it. One, two, three. Broncos. That was fun. Let's try it. Um, how about your favorite dessert? Real quickly, um, favorite dessert. One, two, three. Wow. I didn't hear much, but you're, at least you're excited. All right, who you're voting for this Tuesday? Not this Tuesday. We won't do that one. But let, let's try this. And no shame in this is all, at all. Just be proud of it. Um, the denomination that you grew up in. And if you didn't grow up in the church, just say none. One, two, three. I want to do one more. I had no idea what any of those were, but I'm sure they're fine, I hope. We're glad you're here because we know this is a Bible-believing church, and that's awesome. So We're going to say Jesus. One, two, three. Jesus. Oh, there is power in that. Did you hear it? Did you sense the unity of coming around Jesus and the power that that brings? We need that. He says, oh, stand firm, don't give up, and be together. And then quickly he says, don't be frightened. You know what? Don't be frightened. And this word frightened is actually a a Greek war horse that's spooked to go into battle. So he's basically saying, don't be a spooked war horse that won't go into the battle. We are in a battle. Spiritual battle, right? Paul is saying, do not be spooked. You can be confident because we win. Actually, the Good News Bible says this, they will lose and you will win. And Satan is going to try to distract us. He's going to try to lie to you. Someone once said, when Satan reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Don't be frightened. Heard of a, a, a college player, a hockey player, and he played for this great college D1 hockey school. And they're in the playoffs. And the, the number one player in the third period got knocked out on the ice. Doctors bring him back into the, 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 the area where they can check on him. And they're checking him out. And he, goes, he comes to the coach and he says, 
this doesn't look good. He's been knocked silly. He doesn't even know who he is. And the coach says, tell him he's Wayne Gretzky and get him out on the ice. (laughs) But isn't that us? Don't be disheartened. And and even the next point, I'm coming to a close, but the, the, the next point, we shouldn't be surprised. Why are we so surprised when struggling comes our way? And just like that hockey player, we need to be in God's word and be reminded of who you are. Your identity is in Christ. You are more than a conqueror. You are a son and a daughter of the king. There's no reason you shouldn't be standing firm. There's no reason you should be frightened, which goes into even the next thing. Don't let suffering surprise you. Don't let suffering surprise you. It's been granted on you on behalf of Christ. Not only to know him, but to suffer for him since you're going the same things that I had. Don't just have the faith and the confidence in the easy things of faith. When things are going your way. It's easy to believe then, right? Go out to the mailbox, open the mail. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. There's a disconnect Do you believe when suffering comes your way? You may be suffering persecution from family members, from those who you work with, friends, neighbors. We're starting to see it more in our society and government. They're shutting some things down. And a lot of our response, I can't believe what's going on. I can. We've been warned. Jesus warned us about this. He said, expect this. Not that we are excited about it, but it shouldn't just throw us off and all of a sudden we lose our faith and we're going to this deep depression. No, we will suffer. Don't be surprised by it. Stand firm in the midst of it. Years ago, when they were doing the Promise Keepers Um, men's rallies around the country. I remember one speaker was talking about this same principle, and he he was talking about Michael Jordan. And he said, suppose if Michael Jordan, he's out playing and he comes to the coach and complains to the coach. Coach, make him stop. Every time I have the ball, they're trying to take it. And every time I'm trying to shoot, they put their hand in my face so I can't see. Make him stop. I mean, what do you think the coach would say to him? First of all, Michael, we're paying you like $2 million a game, so quit whining. But he would say, Michael, that is your glory. The fact that you can go onto the basketball court, and they trying to, they're trying to take it away from you, and you're scoring 60 points. Yeah, but if they didn't do that, I would score 100. No, but it's your glory, the fact that they're double and triple teaming you. And you go soaring through the air and still dunk the ball. If it was just a slam dunk contest, it'd be neat. But the fact that you're doing it against double and triple team is amazing. And that is your glory. Isn't Paul saying something similar here? When we face the opposition, don't be surprised. Because when we stay confident and stand firm in it, that is the glory of Christ shining through. And they realize what's going on. And they realize their future. First Peter talks about this same thing. Read through First Peter and talk about how we ought to be people who work for our bosses differently than the world. We ought to love our wives and our husbands differently than how the world does it. Because when we do, people are going to ask us to give a hope for the reason that we have for doing it. And we only have one answer. It's because of Jesus and what Jesus has done in my life. I couldn't do this on my own strength. But Jesus is shining through. Paul gives great reasons of how he can be confident and joyful, but he also says this is how you live it out. And and you live it out and it's difficult, but how do you live this out? Well, you go back and read the first verses we already read. Hope and prayers of the people and it's that circular thinking of Paul. They, they all work in connection with each other. 
Let's pray to our God who gives us this. God, we thank you that you are a God who not only loved us, you demonstrated your love by sending your son to die for us. And because of that, we can read this letter from Paul and agree, but also be encouraged that the same hope that he had, the same hope that he talks about, we each have if we believe in what you've done for us and we've placed our faith in you. I thank you for your love. Thank you for being a God that is worthy of all of your promises. Amen.